Is Libya on the brink of another civil war? A power struggle between rival governments triggers fighting on the streets of the capital Tripoli. Ten years of negotiations, mediation and ceasefires have failed to bring peace. So is there a way out? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the programme. I'm Adrian Finnegan. After two years of relative peace, fighting has returned to the Libyan capital. At least 32 people have been killed in street battles between rival militias in central Tripoli. It's escalating the dispute about who should govern the country. The militias are divided between those who support the UN-recognised government in Tripoli and those who back a rival parliament based in the eastern city of Tobruk. For months, the Eastern Administration's Prime Minister has tried to enter the capital and impose his authority. The UN and the US have appealed for calm, but many Libyans say the international community has failed to secure peace more than 10 years after Muammar Gaddafi was removed from power. Al Jazeera's Malik Trainer reports now from Tripoli. Calm has returned to the capital, Tripoli, after nearly 24 hours of intense and sporadic fighting across the city. Uh, skirmishes began on one, at 1.30 a.m. local time on, in, on Saturday, uh, and that quickly escalated into a wider uh, conflict between rival armed groups, those affiliated with uh, the internationally recognized Prime Minister Abdel Hamid Dabeba, and others who are affiliated with the parallel government. These clashes uh, took place in densely populated areas. Uh, health officials tell us that 32 people have been killed and over 150 injured. Now both governments are placing blame on each other. But people here are extremely frustrated and angry at both governments. Uh, they, want, they want these politicians to settle their differences on the negotiating table and not with bullets and artillery in densely populated areas. 2.8 million Libyans registered to vote in the elections that were supposed to take place in, Dece in December 2021. So there's a huge appetite. Libyans want an end to the political differences, an end to both governments, uh, and they want to vote who they believe can move the country forward and stabilize the country. Mal Trena for Inside Story. Well, stabilizing Libya is important for the West for several reasons. It has Africa's largest oil reserves and control of the sector has contributed to the fighting. Major European oil companies have been active there for decades, but the conflict has hampered their operations. Libya has become a popular departure point for undocumented migrants and refugees and, as a result, human trafficking. Last year, 32,000 asylum seekers crossed the Mediterranean to Europe, more than twice as many as in 2020. Libya is also awash with weapons. Although an ISIL-linked armed group has been defeated, attacks remain a concern. Let's bring in our guests. From Tripoli, we're joined by uh, Salah El Bakush, a former advisor to Libya's High Council of State. From London, Jason Pack, president of Libya Analysis LLC. And from Alexandria, Egypt, Mansour al Kikia, professor of politics at the University of Texas at San Antonio. Gentlemen, good to have you with us on Inside Story. Jason, let's start with you. How dangerous a moment is this for Libya? I think the danger of this moment has been overplayed. Um, it's been happening in slow motion since the beginning of this year. There have been two rival prime ministers. The Europeans and international community have been following a policy of what I call destructive ambiguity, following Imad Adin Badi's phrase, meaning that for the first time, we don't have a clearly recognized prime minister. Dubaiba, the GNU prime minister, has overstayed his mandate. Bashaga has no international legitimacy. So both of them are not, are not legitimate. And the world is so focused on Ukraine that they haven't been trying to mediate this conflict. And of course, given this, it, there's an ability for the Emiratis, Turks and Russians to, you know, play around. And we see what I term the global enduring disorder playing out in Libya. Uh, was there any non-domestic entity involved in this weekend's violence? No, I wouldn't say so. What has happened is that the pretender Fatih Bashaga has flipped some militias in the Tripoli area 
to supporting him. And his allies in Zintan, like Osama Jawaili, had their salaries cut on August 18th. And they thought, well, we're getting weaker over time. We might as well make this move on the Capitol. You have to keep in mind that in May of this year, Bashaga also tried to move on the Capitol, but he was rebuffed and not able to enter it without any clashes. Um, today has already been calm in Tripoli, and it's unlikely that violence would you know, really escalate into a civil war of any kind. And important to point out to your viewers that this isn't an East versus West struggle. Libya has become like any other African country. People try to stay in power after their mandates expire so that they can access the resources of the semi-sovereign institutions, which makes ruling Libya very lucrative. So you have two pretenders for power. They're not really ideologically or regionally differentiated. Both Bashaga and Dubaiba come from Asrata. Each one is on beyond his mandate and doesn't have legitimacy to govern. Uh, Mansour Al-Kikia then uh, in uh, Alexandria. Professor, good to have you with us. Um, uh, to what extent, picking up on what Jason was saying there, to what extent do both parties have credibility issues with the Libyan people, given that their mandates uh, have expired? Uh, uh, thank you for having me, first of all. And I, and I agree with Jason on one point, which he says, that we have an international community that's ambiguous in its, in its, in its deeds. First of all, and I, we have to make this very clear to everyone, to you and everyone else, that Libya is a failed state. I just came from there and I've been there. So I've been, I, I wrote a whole darn book, 500 pages, thinking what wonderful country is going to be after I get that with us. And suddenly I had to tear it all up because it's a failed state. I mean, first of all, you have to see that Mr. Baber, I don't know where he came from, how he came, okay? And ultimately, he's, he's, he's Mr. Gaddafi's, Mr. Gaddafi's uh, contractor. He, he's, a, he's a billionaire who, who made his money with Mr. Gaddafi. I don't particularly like Mr. Bashar either, but I tend to be of the old school. I think the legitimacy does not come from the international community. It comes from Libyans. Libyans have to give the legitimacy. And the only, whether we like it or not, the only legitimate organization we have in Libya is the parliament. However bad it is, it's legitimate. It was the last elected body. Not Bashara, not, not uh, was her, uh, Dbeiba, not Saraj, no one else. And I think here's the, here's the, the crux of the problem. We're having a conflict in Tripoli on, as proxies between two Musratans, whether Bashara and Dbeiba, fighting it out in Tripoli against the Tripolitanians. Now, this is what's happening today. The problem is, is, is that neither of these has legitimacy, and neither of these will get legitimacy if there's open elections in the first place. But ultimately, that's the, this is the consequences of having two states in one state, two parliaments, two uh, governments, and, and two and militias. This is what's going to happen. Okay. I mean, we shouldn't be surprised that this happens. Salah, this is normal. Salah El, El Bakush in, in Tripoli, then, uh, what do you make of, of what you just heard? To what extent could the situation be boiled down to two illegitimate prime ministers normally appointed to deliver elections, which they failed to bring about, and instead are intent on starting a war to ensure that they can hold high office unchallenged? I mean, is that a fair assessment or way off the mark? Look, first of all, I don't understand the meaning of two illegitimate prime ministers. I mean, they are illegitimate if you're going to say that they were not elected. But Ed Beiba, with all his problems, he was selected by a UN-sponsored process that says that he will stay on until elections are held. And he's recognized by the international community. Uh, his government holds the seats in the United Nations, in the Arab League, and in the African Union, and so on. So, uh, so saying that the two uh, uh, bodies are uh, illegitimate, or the two prime ministers are illegitimate, is, is really besides the point, and I don't think it stands uh, uh, any uh, uh, examination. But I don't want to press that. Here is the situation. The situation is that we have the House of Representatives in the East, and the majority of that House is from the West. So it's not a struggle between East and West, as some uh, Jason has suggested. That House has been in place for eight years. Its mandate was 18 months. It's still there. We have in the West the High Council of State, which has which, uh, been in power for 10 years, and they both are responsible for elections. They don't want to get out, and they are now 
trying to give us uh, 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 transitional government number nine in 11 years. And that's what the problem is. What Libyans need, we know that elections are not a, a magic wand, but we've tried everything. Over the last 11 years, we produced 11 governments. These two bodies that exist now, the uh, House of Representatives in the East and the High Council of State in the West, have been responsible for a transitional government. I, 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 I can remind everybody that in 2015, we reached an agreement in Sherat for a transitional government called GNU, Government of National, uh, GNA, Government of National Accord. It was supposed to lead to elections. In 2016, the House of Representatives in the East created a parallel government and killed elections. In 2021, we reached a, a UN-sponsored agreement in Geneva, and we created a unity government called the Government of National okay. Unity to hold elections. In 2022, the, the House of Representatives in the East created uh, uh, the new Bashara government, parallel government, and killed the elections. Right. So right now, the only solution out of this uh, mess is elections that will take away the House of Representatives, the High Council of State, the Baybas government, Bashara's government, and the High uh, the Presidential Council, and give us a fresh chance with a fresh mandate. All right, Jason Pack. What do you make of, of what you heard there? Do any of the political actors in Libya actually care about what the people of Libya want? Does that even factor into their actions? Does, does either one of uh, the, the prime ministers at the moment actually want an election? Well, that's a great point. Neither of them do. And uh, Professor El Khikhiya and Mr. Bakdouche have made key points, which is that this isn't a struggle between East and West. It's a struggle between status quo actors who want to stay in power or keep their cronies in power of the central bank or ODAC, the Office of Development of Administrative Centers, where you can skim billions off the top. And the HOR on, in the East has you know, long passed its mandate. I think that the Libyan people's wishes have been ignored. And Mr. Bakdouche's point that we need elections is key. But he's stressing to my mind too much the legitimacy of the Dubaiba government and the existing institutions. Elections are needed, he's right, but that's to wipe away the old. All the old has no sovereignty. It's passed its mandate. Skirat is no longer legally binding. And I think the key thing is to put this in larger context for your viewers. We are living in a world of global enduring disorder. This is a world in which major nation states can't coordinate with each other. Russia, China, and the U.S. don't coordinate together on climate change and the Arctic because they're fighting in Ukraine and Taiwan and Therefore, they can't get together to work together to find a solution and incentivize Libyans to get their act together. In fact, they meddle and make it more difficult for the various Libyan parties. Turkey is playing a useful mediating role, but they're happy with either prime minister. The Emiratis have flipped sides multiple times. And we need an international community which speaks with one voice to incentivize these Libyan elections and denies sovereignty to anyone who stays on beyond its mandate. Otherwise, we're going to have what we've had for the last 11 years, which is as soon as anyone gets into power, he holds his chair for dear life and uh, never wants to depart his chair because that's where he gains the ability to corrupt money and to put his cronies in charge of various institutions. All right, we'll come back to, to international uh, reaction in just a moment. But to, I, I want to pick up on, on what you were saying at the beginning of that answer there. Professor El, El Kikia, um, would either side be prepared to accept a government led by someone who has no ties to the government of national unity or the Tobruk parliament, uh, does that person even exist? And, and is that actually what the people of Libya want? You see, I, I, think, I think this point is wonderful. What you say is, as Jason said, is, is right to the point. The problem is here, we have Gaddafi is gone, but Gaddafism is still in Libya. Gaddafi spent 40 years hammering out a sense of nationalism in Libyans. They don't, they, they, there's, I mean, you'll be surprised to see that there's no sentiment that they're Libyans, that they, that they owe this land something, that they care about it. They don't. What they care about most is filling their pockets one way or another. And more important, they don't care about legitimacy of anyone else. I mean, I, just coming to Benghazi right now, 
it's it's I was, I was flabbergasted with, with the signs of Carlos with, with the, the drug dealers of, of, of Latin America, the drugs being sold in the streets. There are laws, but there's nobody to enforce them. The problem here is really so it's so serious. It's so serious that that there is no sense that I that I belong to this land. That I owe, I mean, it's the whole idea of not asking what your country does for you, but what you can do for your country is not is not there. The issue is very is, is very serious. There is no sense of Libyanism anymore, not among Libyans at least. So I really don't care about the international community anymore. I don't care whether they, whether they say legitimate or not legitimate because they got us this mess in the first place. Read Miss Miss Williams, Miss Stephanie Williams' uh, departing statement, and it's very clear about what the government is doing right now and what they and what they aspire to. They don't care. As simple as that. If they cared, they wouldn't be there in the first place. They would they would agree on somebody who's neutral, who at least tries to tries to put things together. What we're going right now is to direct towards division. And I'm sorry to say to my friend Mr. Bakush, I really do. I like the guy. He's my friend. He's, he's my brother. But we have two states. We have two governments. We have two parliaments. We have two entities. Very very different. Right now, thanks to this 11 years that we've had and the 40 years of Mr. Gaddafi before that. OK, and of course, you have all of the, the various armed militias in, in the country as well. Mr. El Bakush, exactly, how, exactly. how can democracy exactly. take hold when you have these armed militias in control of large parts of the country? Well, these armed militias are a problem indeed. But this is a symptom and it's not the cause of the problem. The cause of the problem is that we have no constitution, we have no elections, we have no elected government, and that's why right now you can't talk to the Russians and tell them that, for example, get out of the country because he'll tell you, no, the other government wants me in. And the, uh, and the militias say, well, you're not elected. Uh, Haftar tells every government since 2011 that I will not submit to any government that's not elected. So here's, here's the issue. We need to stabilize the political situation so we can deal with the, with, with, with the problem and, but, uh, but and how, the big problem how, how, of militia. But how, sir, how, how, sir, do you do that? We do that by elections. We, the, the thing is, is that when you suggested maybe they will agree to a third government that's neither here, uh, that's neither Beibet or Bashagas, that's exactly what they are aiming for, another deal to split a government. And that's what they did for, for, for the 10 times before. And it didn't get us anywhere. After a year or a year and a couple of months, they, were, uh, they are back at each other's throat and they want another power sharing deal. We're done with that. We need all these bodies that proved beyond doubt that they are incapable, they are incompetent, and they are corrupt. We need, we need them to go and have a fresh chance of doing something else so we can finish the Constitution, for God's sake. We've been working on it for 11 years, and it was supposed to be in the Constitution dec Declaration. It's supposed to be finished within 120 days of one, uh, 2014. So, so here's the situation. We have to deal. We have to deal with the political situation. Get uh, an elected uh, uh, constituent assembly and deal with all these problems. And we can talk with one voice that nobody can challenge its legitimacy. Uh, Jason, um, a, a slightly naive question, perhaps here, but but speaking with one voice as, as one country. I mean, does Libya have a future as one? single country, given at the moment that it's, it's governed by two separate entities and is roughly split, split into east and west? I think Libya is a country. Um, the oil infrastructure crisscrosses east and west. Water from the southeast in Kufra is used to, uh, you know, give the people of Tripoli drinking water and the ports and subsidy systems are connected. I agree with our my other guests. We need bold solutions, but we need to do what um, Mr. Bakdouche suggested, which is separating causes from symptoms. And the cause is the Libyan economic structure. It's not that there's no constitution or that this government or that government is in power. It's the subsidy system and the very nature of how the Libyan economy works. We need an international financial commission. 
which takes control of Libya's finances and makes it that it's not worth fighting for to get control of the central bank. And until that happens, Libya has become Africanized and has become the plaything of the global enduring disorder where Turkey and Russia fight each other, Egypt and the UAE fight each other, and Libyans are just left, you know, on opposite sides of this divide. So it is the very nature of the root causes, which is the Libyan economic system, which promotes resource capture that needs to be treated. Professor, um, how do we bring about what Jason is, is proposing there? That's the million dollar question. I, I, have, I, have, I have no idea. The truth is, I have no idea. Under, under the given what we get, what we're giving in our hands right like now, I don't know how we can do that. Ultimately, I mean, we, 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 the, the problems are enormous. The militias are dominating the West. Hefter is dominating the East. The, 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 the people don't work. There's no, they just don't work. I mean, yes, the economy, you're right, the economics, but whatever oil they're getting out, they're spending it on salaries. There's no, the infrastructure is dilapidated. I mean, this whole idea, where has the money been going, has the money gone for the last 40 years? I have no idea. The roads are not working there. They're, they're just not working. Factories are all gone. And yet, believe it or not, factories have closed. And yet the employees of those factories are still getting wages for the supposedly working in those factories, and they're getting bonuses too, as well too. And if they don't get bonuses, they go on strike. I mean, this is this is this is the dilemma we have right in front of us. Yes, I agree, it's an economic problem. I have no doubt about that. But the country is not working any other way. It's becoming not only, it's worse than a rentier state. Not only getting oil, but they're doing nothing with that oil, except for salaries. They're eating it and they're throwing it away. No more. Salah I have Elba no idea how oh, to right. solve it. Salah El Bakush, how, how do we how do we get away from the, this present moment of danger, then, and and how do we bring about what Jason was was describing uh, for us there, uh, some sort of long term fix here? Is it possible to do? Well, I I, I don't know. Well, as I understand, it, Jason is suggesting that an international uh, mechanism for managing uh, uh, Libya's resources, but I think that's that's probably akin to Mr. Trump suggesting that we drink bleach to get rid of uh, Corona. Uh, it's not possible. So, uh, so I think the international community succeeded in 2021 to tell the uh, House of Representatives and the High Council of State that they have no monopoly on the political process and brought 13 of the House of Representatives and 13 of the House, uh, the High Council of State, into the Libyan political dialogue, which had 75 people. And they managed to get a unified government. Mr. Kovic dropped the ball later on, and uh, here we are. Mm. So I think we can go back to the same process and finish it by elections that 2.8 million people registered for it, like your report suggested. There is no other way out of it. We can't continue with these bodies that gave us all these transitional governments and we are still in the same place, but maybe worse than we were uh, five or ten years ago. Jason, I've got a minute left on the program. We'll give the, the last word to you. What, what, do you, what do you make of, of what you just heard there? Thank you. I don't think elections are the solution. It's not about nationalizing or internationalizing Libya's finances, but changing the rules of the game making things transparent, having an international financial commission which oversees Libya's finances, and that unifies the previously divisive international actors. Russians, Turks, Emiratis all need to get their back payments paid, as do the Italians and French and Americans. We need to adjudicate all of the corruption and pay some contracts 10 cents on the dollar and other 80 cents on the dollar. This can be solved. There are win-win solutions there. The UN is moribund. It's going to need to have a okay. fit-for-purpose vehicle, yeah. probably led by the EU, the US, with our allies okay. like Turkey and the Emirates. Gentlemen. Um, this is low-hanging fruit. Yeah. And we can do this if we rally the kind of resolve that has been shown in Ukraine. Gentlemen, we're out of time. Many thanks indeed for being with us. Salah al -Bakush. Uh, Jason Pack and uh, Professor Mansour El Kirkia. Uh, and thank you for watching. Don't forget you can see the program again at any time just by going to the website at aljazeera.com. For further discussion 
on this, join us at our Facebook page. That's at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can join the conversation on Twitter. We're at, at AJ Inside Story. From me, Adrian Finnegan, and the whole team here in Doha. Thanks for being with us. I'll see you again. Bye-bye.